Hello everyone, my name is Ben and I teach people about the anatomy of lifting. Today we're going to go over the lower pecs and specifically how to grow and how to specifically target the lower pecs if they're lagging for you. So what we're going to do is we're going to go over first the anatomy, so fiber direction, muscle architecture, where does it attach, those kinds of things. Then we're going to talk about the physics of the muscle. So how does it move? How do, which bones does it act on? And what does the path of motion it creates actually look like? And we're going to do that on a, a real uh, skeleton model. And then lastly, we're going to go over training application. So how do you integrate the anatomy and the physics together in an actual training setting? So without further ado, let's talk about the anatomy first. So the costal pecs, in other words, the lower pecs, also referred to as the abdominal pecs, whatever you want to call them, they're the ones that sit in this direction or run sort of from high to low and like all the other pecs they attach on the upper portions of the arm right here it's uh, sort of faded but it is underneath of the deltoid right here and this one traverses downward toward what are known as the costal cartilages right below the sternum now some people like to call this portion of the pec the sternocostal pec and basically what they'll do is they will lump this entire portion of the pec together as one thing i don't like to do that because i do think the functions can be quite different uh, depending on which portion of that muscle you're targeting. So today in this video, we're really talking about this portion right here, right? The ones that are truly the lower portions of the pec. And again, when I say costal cartilages, they just that just refers to like this attachment site over here. And interestingly enough, um, because people refer to it as the abdominal division, the reason that people refer to it as the abdominal division is because it attaches directly to what is known as the rectus abdominis, which many of you have heard of, otherwise known as the six pec. So given that we understand its origin, uh, which is basically from here to here, and you can't obviously see it, but the six pack muscle sort of runs from here downward, if you can imagine it that way, and it runs from low to high up into the upper arm. So this is the portion of the pec that is really going to be the thing that actually fills out uh, that, that lower portion of the chest. All right, so just to sort of go back here for this visual, that's what's going to kind of create this nice shadow looking thing here toward the bottom of the chest. So now that we have a basic understanding of just the structure of the lower pecs, let's look at the physics of the lower pecs and specifically how it moves, what bones it attaches to, and how we can stretch and shorten it most before we move into training application. All right, so when we look at Frank's lower pecs here, the lower pecs are gonna be indicated by these two uh, yellow lines. So this is a little crude, it'll make a lot of sense, I think. So a couple things to remember here. Number one, it runs from low to high and it attaches from sort of uh, these costal cartilages, again, that rectus abdominis sheath up into the upper arm. So it's gonna run at this angle. And what that means is that if we take this point and this point and we stretch them as far away from one another as we can, what that's gonna kind of look like is not just something that's slightly backward, like in this, in this horizontal, horizontal direction, but backward and upward, right? So to lengthen this guy, what we would do is we would take the arm, we would pull it back behind our body, and then we would allow this shoulder blade to move backward and upward along the rib cage like this. And so what that looks like on me right now is the direction of, of sort of my arm moving upward and backward at this angle, right? To stretch these fibers here, and then to allow my shoulder blade to move back and up. Now, many of you have probably been told that your shoulders need to move back and down, and that is incorrect. The shoulder blade, per the constraints of the rib cage, the clavicle and the scapula actually moves in an upward and backward direction as it moves into what's called full retraction, which is basically just the shoulder blade moving inward toward the spine. So when the arm is fully behind the body, we actually, and especially to stretch this guy, we need to allow the shoulder blade to come sort of back and up as these fibers wrap around the rib cage. Okay, so another thing to note is that if we look at the lower packs from this angle, again, to reorient these yellow guys here, because they run low to high and because they run horizontally, they will be most stretched and most sort of in line with whatever we're trying to do if our arm is a little bit tighter to our body. Now, does that mean that you need to smoosh your arm into your body here? No, but it just means that relative to like this position here, if you're pressing at a sort of decline angle, as we'll discuss in the training section, you wanna make sure that your arm is sort of comfortably in this middle ground here, not super super out wide and then also not super narrow. So just experiment around with what feels comfortable, find that comfortable slot. But in essence, what the lower portions of the pack will do is it will take the arm from being behind the body here and then we'll pull it toward that point of attachment there. And the last thing to note is, and as we'll discuss in the training section, um, make sure that you're not restricting any of this stuff from moving. Because the lower pec specifically attach from somewhere that is not moving to somewhere that is moving, unlike the upper pecs, unlike the front deltoid, let's say, they actually have a tremendous capacity to move the entire shoulder girdle. And so just to make the distinction, this is motion of the shoulder joint itself, just ball and socket sort of articulation here. 
But as you move the arm backward, this whole complex, the shoulder complex, clavicle, scapula, and upper arm are going to, and they should move all together. So as you move your arm back, this whole thing is gonna come up and back as a unit. And then as you press, this lower pec is gonna move this whole thing forward and downward. So now let's discuss what a training application, what a lifting application of training the lower pecs should look like. All right, so now that we have a really good understanding about what the anatomy of the lower pecs are like and specifically how they function and what motions they create, it's time to actually apply this information to the gym so that we can train the lower pecs most specifically. So a couple major principles here just before we get into things, two major principles. Number one is you want to make sure that as per our discussion that you are using a relatively tighter arm path. This is not a hard and fast rule, but I do find that for most people, a comfortable sort of middle ground between super wide and super narrow is is probably a good place to at least start to explore this stuff. And I'll obviously show some examples here, but that's number one is a relatively tighter arm path, again, so that we can sort of stretch and shorten the lower pecs in the direction it's most specifically going to act. And then number two is really make sure that you're allowing your shoulder blades to move. And we'll sort of go through this visually now, a lot of people restrict motion of the shoulder blades. And as we discussed in the functional anatomy section just now, moving the shoulder girdle is one of the things that the lower pecs are really, really, really good at doing. So why would you want to restrict a motion that the lower pecs are good at doing? It doesn't make much sense. So what that would sort of look like is something like this, right? So this is a decline cable press, which should not come as a surprise in terms of exercise selection to most of you. Uh, you've Many of you have probably done this motion before, but if you haven't, you've probably done something similar, kind of maybe like a dip or like a decline bench press, a decline dumbbell press or a decline machine press. Anything similar to this pattern is gonna be really, really specific to training the lower portions of the pecs. And the first thing that I want you all to notice, number one, is that arm path that I'm using, as I mentioned. So again, if you, would, if you were to sort of look at me from the front, what you would see is that my arm is not really, really high up wide or, or really, really narrow. It's just basically where can I pull my arm as far back as possible. That sort of comfortable slot uh, you should probably find before you actually start to execute the motion. Something I like to do is just pull my arm back into a sort of row position just to make sure I can get back there comfortably. And then also what you're going to want to make sure of in tandem with that arm path, uh, again, as I mentioned, is getting comfortable moving the shoulder girdle and the shoulder blades. Now, many of you will probably just do this naturally, but I want you all instead of just focusing on, you know, the upper arm in the direction of the cable, which we'll talk about in a second, focus on what is sort of happening here at my shoulder girdle, right at the clavicle and the scapula, as I mentioned in the previous section, watch how things sort of come up, I, I sort of in, in, in intentionally shrugging upward and backward. As I come backward, I'm not necessarily thinking about it as a row, like I'm not actively pulling backward. But I am sort of imagining my shoulder blades moving upward and backward Again, not uh, not backward and downward again, the scaps don't move that way at this extreme. And then what I'm doing is I'm basically just pressing against that direction and I'm not restricting motion of the scaps. And I think that's all that you probably in most cases really need to understand is just this concept of not restricting motion rather than trying to be super intentional about where precisely your shoulder blades are moving. Your shoulder blades and your clavicles are going to move slightly different from mine based on your structure and your anatomy. So don't try to be super, super focused on, you know, where exactly your shoulder blades are, but rather just don't restrict the motion and allow the motion to naturally happen. Now, the next thing and this is probably the most important is the resistance direction, right? So as we discussed, the lower pecs specifically are running in this direction and they're going to pull this entire segment forward, right? The upper arm and the shoulder girdle forward in that direction, high to low. So where do we want a direction of resistance? Well, if you look at yourself, if you film yourself from this kind of pressing angle, you essentially want a resistance direction that is parallel and opposite to the fiber direction, right? Makes sense intuitively. And so whenever you're doing any kind of decline thing, that's kind of what is, is happening, right? You're basically taking one point of attachment here and one point of attachment here, and you are stretching them as far away from each other as possible uh, with a direction of resistance that is pulling that way. Okay, so here's one example. This is probably one of my all time favorite low pec movements It's just, you know, dragging a bench up in front of a cable stack. If you do have a functional trainer, this is awesome. But I realize that many of you probably have access to different implements. Uh, and, and maybe it's not super practical set up in your gym. So here are some other examples of just me applying the same principle. Both of these are machine presses. And again, in both cases, what you will notice is my arms are sort of comfortably, comfortably tighter to my body. 
And in this particular case, I will pause this in this position. What I've done is I have actually pulled my sternum sort of upward, a little bit of an arch in my back. And what that does is it allows me to load my arms in a direction that is very specific to the direction that these lower pecs are pulling, right? And so if, if you can imagine, if I did not have my sternum sort of pulled up and arched, and instead my sternum was maybe sort of more downward, right? My back was a little bit flatter. That would introduce a situation where the lower pecs would still contribute, of course, but not nearly as much as if I'm loading at this sort of low to high angle. And this doesn't really look like it's a low to high angle, but again, it's all about the relationship between what is happening with the resistance direction and where your arms are getting smushed and what in response your muscles and specific your, specifically your lower pec in this case has to do. So again, when you're using a machine that's kind of more of a flat press like this one, you can just get a little bit of an arch in your trunk, a little bit of an arch in your spine, and then just sort of go to town on the press in that way, assuming you have a comfortable arm path. And again, I'm not restricting motion of my shoulder blades, With this particular implement, I don't have as much motion just because the range is a little bit shorter, but that's perfectly fine. Again, the differences between you know a couple of degrees of motion is probably not going to be huge. And then here's yet another example uh, of a press that is sort of somewhat similar to the other two, although it is a little bit less specific to the lower pec, the point will sort of remain the same. I get to the bottom position and I ask, okay, what direction is this machine sort of pushing my arm, right? And where is my sternum and where are my lower pecs as a consequence of my sternum and my rib cage? they're kind of pulling now at this angle, right? So there will be a good, good amount of uh, sort of middle pack involvement In the middle pack, by the way, you obviously can't separate from the lower pack, um, so it will be contributing in all, all these motions as well if that's a goal of yours, um, which, you know, not that you could do anything about that to begin with. But in essence, again, hopefully you're starting to sort of see how the principles here remain the same across all scenarios. You look at the direction of resistance, you ask yourself, where is the direction of resistance pushing my arm? And I just sort of let this play. In this particular case, again, I'm creating a little bit of that arch in my back so that I can load at a slightly more low to high angle. Again, this isn't perfect. And as I fatigue, I'm really just pushing as hard as I can until I can't really get out of that bottom position, right? So in the beginning, I'm kind of just sort of using again, that por portion of the motion where my arm is moving forward and backward. And then if I skip forward here as a fatigue, I'm really just greasing that groove of that bottom end of the range so that I can really fully fatigue the pecs. Now, I want to show one other option here, and this is a little bit of a non-traditional option, and I probably wouldn't recommend it as a first choice, but if you're looking to add some extra volume, it's probably a safe bet. And this is basically a single arm press. And what you'll notice is that anytime you're doing a single arm press, you're highly unstable, meaning that as you go to press the weight, what you'll notice is that your trunk is probably getting turned all over the place. You probably feel your abs and you know some stuff in your legs if you're bracing your legs. And so what you need to do if you are using a single arm press or you know whether it's a cable or a dumbbell or something similar, is you need to make sure that you're pulling on something with the opposite hand. Right, and so in this particular case, I'm pulling with my left hand uh, as I press with my right hand to prevent my trunk from turning, right? Because if I just sort of haphazardly went about this press without some sort of um, implement that I was pulling this direction against, my trunk would just be turning in the direction of the cable like this. Right, so if you are going to do a single arm press and you are going to do a single arm cable press, which by the way can have tremendous application if you're not someone who's super comfortable with two arm pressing, um, because you can adjust your arms so freely, you can adjust your trunk so freely, um, experiment around with this and apply the same principles that we've been talking about, right? So notice again, this is not from the best angle to look at, But this direction of the cable, as you can see, sort of where it's anchored up here, is low to high relative to my arm. So what's going to have to sort of resist that? Again, these lower packs, which are running in this direction, pulling the shoulder girdle, pulling the arm against that cable. So again, if you are going to experiment around with the single arm press, really, really make sure that you have something else to pull against. This is, again, sort of a weird jerry-rigged setup, but the principle remains the same. If you had access to something like this machine, like a functional trainer, you could use actually one side of the lever uh, or one of the levers to sort of hold on to while you use the other cable to uh, uh, press with. So those are the basic principles. Again, very simply, choose a comfortable arm path, allow that scapula and that upper arm to come upward and backward against a resistance which is trying to pull you upward and backward and your lower pecs will have a great time. And if you like this video, please subscribe and please share with a friend, it helps a lot. If you like this content and you want to learn more from me, you definitely need to check out the Modern Meathead community. Inside the community, you'll get direct access to me for one-on-one -on -one personalized feedback. In addition, you'll get access to hundreds of hours of premium content exclusive to members only. When you get inside the community, you'll get direct access to all these different features. Now, I make daily posts covering different exercises where I post videos of exercises directly, the anatomy of those exercises, and very specific breakdowns relative to whatever the goals of that exercise are. In addition, members are posting things 
things every day with comments and questions of their own. And what you can see is as we go through all these different kinds of posts, I respond to everything, every question, every comment directly, and I'll give direct feedback in the comment section as to all the different exercise variations you post. In addition, when you look over to the left side of your community, we have all these different community forms, but you'll also get access to all these different courses that I have on biomechanics, programming, pain-free training, as well as coaching and queuing. And when you click into the course, you'll see your videos on the left and then all the different other videos of the course on the right side. In addition, you'll also get access to an exercise library where I'm constantly adding new exercises, basically everything that I film in the gym with step-by-step -step tutorials. You'll also get access to previous Q&A recordings that I do on Instagram and live in the community, as well as all these other specific member lectures, which can last from 30 minutes to an hour every single week. You'll also get access to premium articles, eBooks, and all of my training programs with just one subscription. So if you wanna learn more about the anatomy of lifting and a community of like-minded individuals who are all lifting obsessed, you can start your seven day free trial, zero risk subscription today.